we now have Naya's skull, and Naya has a complete skull. And from that complete skull, we are going to reconstruct her face. For decades, scientists, archaeologists, and historians have fought over one question. Who were the first Americans, and where did they come from? Every theory pointed north to the frozen land bridge that once connected Asia and Alaska. But deep beneath the jungles of Mexico, inside a flooded cave sealed for thousands of years, a single discovery has torn that story apart. The discovery beneath the Caribbean. Beneath the town of Tulum in Mexico lies one of the largest cave systems on Earth. It is a network of flooded tunnels called cenotes. These natural sinkholes formed when sections of the limestone ground collapsed, exposing the underground rivers that run beneath the surface. To visitors, these blue pools look like perfect places to swim. To scientists, they are sealed rooms that hold pieces of the past. The system runs for hundreds of kilometers beneath the Yucatan Peninsula and links major caves such as Sac Actun and Dos Ojos. Divers who enter describe a silent world where a wrong turn can be fatal. That risk did not stop exploration. It only raised the stakes. According to local accounts, sport divers began mapping these caves in the 1980s. They laid guideline ropes, recorded video, and drew rough maps of the passages. The goal was adventure, not research. In the early 2000s, reports began to circulate in diving circles that bones were visible under the silt. Some said the remains were animal. Others whispered they were human. None of it was confirmed at first. The stories were easy to dismiss until multiple teams reported seeing the same thing in separate chambers. Archaeologists from Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History were alerted. They partnered with experienced local divers to verify the claims. The first joint surveys were cautious. Teams moved slowly, marked every turn, and used strict procedures to avoid disturbing the floor. What they saw under the lights ended the debate. Human bones lay on the cave sediments. Some lay near the remains of extinct animals. There was no sign of modern burial activity. The remains looked ancient. The tone of the project changed immediately. The cenotes were no longer treated as places for thrill-seeking or exploration. They had become protected archaeological sites, where every movement required permits, documentation, and strict scientific procedures. Teams logged the locations of finds and photographed them in place. According to project notes, early crews used simple grids and slates. Later groups added higher quality video and more accurate underwater mapping. The goal was to document before touching anything. Each confirmed discovery raised the same questions. Who were these people? How did their remains end up in these flooded chambers? And how long had they been here, sealed in darkness? For decades, researchers had believed that the first Americans arrived about 12,000 years ago, crossing from Siberia into Alaska over the Bering Land Bridge and slowly moving south through ice-free corridors. But if humans were already living this far south during the last ice age, then that story might be missing a major chapter. The discovery was only the beginning. Now scientists had to find out who these people were and how long they had been waiting in the dark. The next step was to test, date, and explain what the divers had found. The caves that guarded the dead. Once the discoveries were verified, the work shifted from exploration to investigation. Teams returned with clear plans and strict controls. The National Institute of Anthropology and History coordinated permits and conservation. Divers placed scale bars, shot controlled video, and used photogrammetry to build three-dimensional models so the bones could be studied without moving them. Catalog numbers were assigned. Locations were logged. According to field reports, this was the only way to protect fragile material in a risky environment. The caves created perfect conditions for preservation. There was no sunlight, almost no oxygen, and no scavengers to disturb the remains. The water was cool and still, so the bones and teeth kept their shape for thousands of years. But this same environment also caused a problem. The minerals in the water slowly replaced the organic material inside the bones, removing the collagen that scientists need for radiocarbon dating. Without collagen, they had no way to measure the age of the remains using standard methods. It meant they needed a different way to tell time, another scientific method that could reveal how long the bones had been there. Researchers turned to the thin crusts that had formed on the bones, over time, a film of calcite grows inside caves. It traps small amounts of uranium that slowly changes to thorium. By measuring those elements, scientists could estimate when the crust formed. Since the crust sits on top of the bone, the result gives a minimum age for the person beneath it. It is a careful method, and it requires clean sampling and lab checks, but it can work where carbon dating fails. The first dates were a shock. 
Several skeletons were older than 10,000 years. Some pushed deeper into the late ice age. According to published summaries, this placed people in southern Mexico far earlier than many experts had expected. If that was true, these individuals or their ancestors had crossed a continent in a time frame that challenged the standard classroom story. Some researchers were excited. Others were skeptical and asked for more samples and independent checks. The debate was serious because the stakes were high. Physical study added another surprise. Skulls from some caves were long and narrow. Skulls from others were rounder with lower foreheads. Teeth showed different patterns of wear. Limb proportions varied. The differences were not small. Within a limited region, the range looked larger than expected. Some specialists argued that diet and local conditions could explain these shapes inside one connected population. Others believed that more than one group had reached Mexico at different times. A few even suggested as speculation that separate routes into the Americas might have been used. The mystery deepened with every labeled bag and every new scan. The caves had guarded the dead, and now they were forcing hard questions. How many groups were there? How fast did they arrive? How much of this variation was the environment? And how much was ancestry? And within that search came one discovery that seemed ready to answer everything. Chan Hole 3, the woman who wouldn't speak, in 2016, a team of cave divers followed a narrow passage near Tulum known as Chan Hole, which means little hole in the Mayan language. The dive was part of an ongoing effort to map unexplored branches of the cave system, which had already produced human remains in earlier expeditions. The site had previously yielded fragments of ancient bone, bits of charcoal, and stone flakes, suggesting Ice Age humans had once entered the caves to make tools or light small fires. But what the divers found this time was beyond anything they had seen before. In a quiet, mineral-covered chamber, half buried in silt, they found the partial skeleton of a woman. Her bones were positioned as if she had fallen suddenly and been slowly sealed by sediment and minerals over thousands of years. The divers photographed every angle and marked the location before surfacing to alert archaeologists. What began as a simple mapping exercise had just become one of the most important archaeological discoveries in the Yucatan's history. When scientists returned with proper equipment, they realized how unusual the find was. Unlike previous remains, her skeleton was coated in a thick, glassy layer of calcite. Over thousands of years, mineral-rich water had covered her bones, creating a marble-like casing that shielded her from the water currents. She looked as if she had been carved from stone. This unique preservation earned her the nickname, The Woman in Stone. According to reports, researchers from the National Institute of Anthropology and History called her one of the most complete and best-preserved early human skeletons ever found in the Americas. To determine her age, scientists collected samples of the calcite on her femur. Using uranium-thorium dating, they measured the radioactive isotopes in the mineral crust. The results were remarkable. The crust had begun forming at least 9,900 years ago, which meant the woman had lived near the end of the Ice Age. Her presence confirmed that people were already living in Mexico when sea levels began to rise and the world was changing. Her bones revealed even more about her life. Dental analysis showed severe cavities, deep holes that would have caused chronic pain. For a person of her time, this was unusual. It suggested she ate tropical foods rich in natural sugar, like fruit, roots, or honey. Her diet reflected a shift from hunting large Ice Age animals to gathering forest foods, showing how early humans had adapted to new environments as the climate warmed. Her skull carried another story, one marked by violence and endurance. It bore three healed fractures, each from a different period in her life. Some experts believe she may have been injured during conflict, while others think the wounds could be connected to ritual practices or accidents inside the caves. Microscopic analysis revealed that she had also suffered from a long-term bacterial infection that caused swelling and fatigue. Despite the pain, she lived into her early 30s, an impressive lifespan for her time. Every detail pointed to a life of resilience, but her ancestry remained a mystery. The water had destroyed all traces of DNA, erasing the genetic record that could have revealed who she was and where she came from. Her bones told of struggle and survival, yet they stayed silent about her origins. When scientists compared her skull to others found across Mexico, an even stranger pattern began to take shape. The Puzzle of Two Faces As discoveries from the Yucatan's flooded caves gained attention, scientists began comparing them with other ancient remains across Mexico. The goal was to understand whether all these early people, those found in caves, deserts, and highlands, shared the same ancestry. The results were unsettling. The skulls from the Yucatan were short and rounded, with wide faces and low foreheads. 
the ones from central and northern Mexico, mostly found in dry rock shelters and open-air sites, were long and narrow, their features sharper and taller. These differences appeared too consistent to dismiss as random variation. To many researchers, this was evidence of something deeper. Physical anthropologists from Mexico, the United States, and Brazil began a large comparative study using digital scans and geometric models to analyze every skull in detail. The results confirmed two clear patterns. One group of scientists argued that this meant Mexico had once been home to two distinct populations. The round-headed group, they said, belonged to the earliest humans in the Americas, a people who arrived first and later vanished. The narrow-headed skulls, they believed, came from the ancestors of modern Native Americans who replaced them thousands of years later. But not everyone agreed. A second group of experts argued that these differences could have developed naturally within a single, connected population. Over generations, changes in diet, temperature, and environment might have reshaped the human skull. People in the humid tropics of the Yucatan may have eaten softer plant foods, while those in the dry northern plains lived on tougher meat, developing longer faces and narrower jaws. In this view, evolution, not replacement, explained the contrast. The debate split the field, conferences became heated, some papers were retracted, others accused colleagues of forcing evidence to fit their theories. The disagreement was not just about skulls, but about the entire history of how humans first entered the Americas. For years, progress stalled. The one thing everyone agreed on was the missing piece, DNA. Tropical heat and water had destroyed genetic material in every Yucatan skeleton. Scientists could describe the faces, but not trace their bloodlines. New 3D tools confirmed the variations were real, but could not explain why they existed. The field reached what some called the Paleo-American deadlock. Then, a new rumor began to spread among divers working less than 50 kilometers from Tulum. Deep inside a vast, bell-shaped sinkhole, they had found an entire skeleton lying beside Ice Age animal bones. The chamber was so deep that sunlight never reached it. The divers called it Hoyo Negro, the black hole. And in that darkness, a young girl who died long before history began would finally hold the answer that science had been chasing for decades. Hoyo Negro, the girl frozen in time. Divers dropped into a vast sinkhole known as Hoyo Negro and swept their lights across a floor that swallowed the beam. The outline appeared first. A full human skeleton lay beside the bones of Ice Age animals. Ribs, vertebrae, and a delicate skull rested among sloths and extinct bears. It looked like a single accident that ended a life in an instant. According to field notes, the team froze, then began the slow work of recording everything before a single fragment was moved. The body belonged to a teenage girl. Later measurements placed her at about 15 to 16 years old at death. Her skeleton was unusually complete. The skull, ribs, and long bones were still articulated, which is rare in any archaeological context and almost unheard of in underwater caves. The still water and protected chamber had locked her in place. Every bone seemed to sit exactly where it landed. Scientists needed to know when she lived. They took samples from stalagmites near the skeleton and from the nearby animal remains. Those materials hold tiny traces of radioactive elements that change at a steady rate. By measuring those changes, researchers can estimate when the minerals formed and when the animals died. The results put the girl firmly in the late Pleistocene, around 13,000 years ago. That placed her among the earliest known people in the region and made the find immediately central to the debate over the first Americans. Her face shape raised the stakes even higher. The skull was long and narrow with fine features that did not match the rounded skulls found in other Yucatan caves. Physical anthropologists recognized this pattern from earlier studies, and some believed it signaled a different founding population. According to several researchers, this could point to a first wave of settlers who were later replaced by the ancestors of modern Native Americans. Others pushed back and argued that shape can change within one connected population as environments and diets shift. The cave was no longer just a place. It had become evidence that demanded a verdict. Work at the site moved carefully. The chamber floor was mapped in detail. Photogrammetry created three-dimensional models so that the skeleton and animal bones could be studied without heavy handling. Every sample was logged. Protocols to prevent contamination were strict because any mistake would ruin the most important tests. 
Then came a surprise that no one expected in a warm, wet cave. When specialists drilled a tiny sample from one of the girl's teeth, they found preserved mitochondrial DNA. It was not a full genome, it was a fragile thread, but it was real genetic material from a person who had lived at the end of the Ice Age. According to lab notes, the room went silent. For years, experts had claimed that the Yucatan would never yield ancient DNA. This single tooth had just proved them wrong. The skeleton now had a voice waiting to be heard. Scientists prepared the analyses that could finally test whether the differences in skull shape meant separate peoples or a single, adaptable population. What that single tooth would reveal stood ready to shake theories to their core. The genetic revelation that shattered the debate. When the results from the laboratory finally came back, no one was prepared for what they showed. The ancient DNA extracted from Nia's tooth had survived against every known scientific expectation. For years, experts believed that genetic material could not last in the hot, humid conditions of Mexico's underwater caves. Yet here it was, clear, testable, and strong enough to reveal her maternal lineage. Genetic sequencing showed that Nia's mitochondrial DNA belonged to haplogroup D1, this lineage traces its origin to a population that once lived in a region called Beringia, the stretch of land that connected Siberia to Alaska during the last ice age. Between about 25 and 15,000 years ago, when massive ice sheets locked up much of the world's water, the sea level dropped and exposed a frozen bridge of grasslands and tundra. It was through this land that the first groups of humans migrated from Asia into the Americas. As the ice melted and sea levels rose, Beringia disappeared beneath the water, but its people continued southward, spreading across the continent. This single genetic link confirmed that Nia was part of that same founding population. She was not from a lost or replaced group. She was one of the first true Americans, a descendant of the Ice Age travelers who had crossed from Asia and adapted to a new world. What made this finding extraordinary was how it contradicted earlier assumptions. Her skull shape had suggested she belonged to a vanished population, yet her DNA told the opposite story. In one moment, her tooth united two branches of science that had long seemed impossible to connect. The physical evidence said one thing, but the genetic proof said another. Together they revealed a deeper truth. Early humans in the Americas were far more diverse in appearance than scientists had ever realized. The rounded skulls, the long skulls, the subtle differences between North and South, all of it now made sense. These were not signs of separate races or multiple migrations. They were signs of adaptation. Humans had reached the Americas and, within a few thousand years, evolved features suited to their new environments. Those who lived in tropical regions developed broader skulls and lighter bone structures. Those who lived in colder climates retained longer, narrower skulls. The diversity once used to divide them was now proof of their shared ancestry and remarkable ability to adapt. The revelation was a turning point. For decades, archaeologists had debated whether the Americas were populated by one wave of migration or several. Nia's DNA provided the clearest evidence yet that there was one main founding population whose descendants spread throughout the hemisphere. Her genetic signature still appears today among indigenous peoples across North and South America. The impact rippled through anthropology, textbooks, research papers, and long-standing migration models had to be rewritten. Scientists who once stood on opposite sides of the argument were forced to reconsider what the first Americans truly meant. The discovery did not just solve a mystery, it reshaped the foundation of American prehistory, but its meaning went beyond science. For many indigenous communities, Nia's lineage was not only proof of ancestry, but also validation of continuity, a living connection between the first families who crossed the land bridge and those who still walk the same ground today. It showed that their history is not ancient or lost. It is ongoing and alive in their cultures, languages, and bloodlines. Even now, hundreds of remains across the Yucatan remain silent. Their DNA has long since dissolved, leaving only fragments of bone and mineral dust. Yet new techniques, like sedimentary DNA recovery and protein analysis, are beginning to draw whispers from the places where ordinary science once failed. Each discovery brings us closer to completing the human story, not just of how people arrived, but of how they endured, adapted, and remained. If one girl's tooth could rewrite the story of the first Americans, what other secrets do you think still lie hidden beneath the caves of Mexico? Share your theory in the comments. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.